Hi, I'm Peter J. Ray. Welcome. Today's topic is the 1897 Cleveland Spiders NL MLB baseball season. Spiders had a strong year in 1897. They, they, uh, well, again, they were playing in the National League, and their home field in Cleveland was League Park. And they finished with a record of 69 and 62. So that's uh, respectable. Seven games over 500. Winning percentage of 527 in fifth place in the National League, 23 and a half games out of first place. First place team was the Boston Bean Eaters, who are 93 and 39. Second place, Baltimore Orioles, 90 and 40. Third place, New York Giants, 83 and 48. Fourth place, the Cincinnati Reds, 76 and 56. Fifth place, the Cleveland Spiders, 69 and 62. Sixth place, the Washington Senators, 61 and 71. Seventh place, the Brooklyn Bridegrooms, 61 and 71. Eighth place, the Pittsburgh Pirates, 60 and 71. Ninth place, the Chicago Colts, 59 and 73. Tenth place, the Philadelphia Phillies, 50, 55 and 77. Eleventh place, the Louisville Colonels, 52 and 78. And in 12th and last place, the St. Louis Browns had a tough year. They were 29 and 102. Now, one of the big problems for Major League Baseball during this era in the 1890s was that there was, uh, there was just too much violence, you know, uh, players, you know, basically being too hard on umpires and you know, players fighting each other and so forth. And this was really uh, problematic because, you know, this, this was turning off uh, women and children from coming, you know, the uh, uh, yeah, women and the obscene language. So there was a, there was a, there was a real desire. They thought, well, we, we need to get higher attendance uh, to, to make the teams more profitable. Well, that means attracting uh, families with women and children. And so they were trying to make, you know, reduce the violence and so forth, make it more uh, civilized. And it was, they're having a hard time finding umpires willing to do the job because there was too much abuse of umpires. Now, Frank Robinson in 1897 decided to cut costs, and spring training was in Cleveland. They didn't go south. They were at the Cleveland Athletic Club. And they did various things there, a handball, there was a running track, dumbbells, calisthenics, throwing and catching. And, uh, and, and uh, well, because the year before, the attendance had been down. And still, there was uh, no Sunday baseball in Cleveland. This was a huge problem because that was the big day of the year. There was an alliance of the Cleveland Ministers Association, which uh, uh, every, every Sunday, you know, they were uh, speaking in the pulpit about the evils of breaking the Sabbath and downtown saloon owners. Uh, downtown soon, uh, there was this alliance you know, the downtown saloon owners wanted people to uh, go to the bars on Sundays, not go to the ball game. And it was uh, reported, quote, men and boys will go to the games and spend 75 cents they would otherwise leave with us, one local tavern proprietor said. Robeson planned a Sunday game at League Park on May 16th uh, in defiance of the law, and 9,500 fans came, and there were 5,000 uh, estimated 5,000 to 15,000 fans outside. After the first inning, the nine Spiders players and nine Senators players and the umpire were all arrested. So they did not uh, finish the game. Uh, Frank Robeson spoke to the crowd and he said, quote, Ladies and gentlemen, we are ordered by the police to refrain from fracturing a state law. The law must be respected. I will take this case into the state courts. And I believe we will be victorious. The fans cheered. So there really was a popular desire for Sunday baseball, but these uh, you know, Christian uh, ministers were the real reasons why it wasn't happening and why the law was being enforced. The players were all taken to the police station and released on a $100 bond. Frank Robeson said this, quote, Sunday baseball is endorsed by the masses of this city, as was shown by the enormous crowd that wanted to see today's game. The inconsistency of the whole business is proven by the scores of Sunday amateur games that are being played in Cleveland and throughout Ohio and throughout Ohio today. To say nothing of professional ball at Cincinnati, Toledo, Columbus, and Dayton. I'll admit 
that there is a state law now practically obsolete that prohibits Sunday ball, but the prohibition is under a vague statute that forbids amusements in general on Sunday. It is an unpopular law and antagonistic to the desires of the public. I'll fight this case to the finish in the courts. Now, initially, Robeson won the court case. Sunday baseball was allowed, and on July 5th, on July 25th, there was 20, 15,000 came to watch the Spiders play at League Park on a Sunday. However, the, uh, the forces, again, anti-Sunday baseball forces appealed. It was not settled, uh, but they, they could play. Uh, they were able to play Sunday baseball for the rest of that summer, but it was still had not been settled uh, long term. The popular hit song of 1897 was Oh, Susanna. Euclid Beach Park was a a popular amusement park in the summer, and uh, there were uh, buttons buttons for men's trousers were being phased out, and z- zippers were replacing them in 1897. Uh, on July 9th, the entire city of Cleveland was, Cleveland was equipped with street signs, so that was good, helping people to get around and uh, find places. Uh, with respect to the end of the 1890s season, now... Uh, uh, one thing we haven't mentioned is the big news, the, the big story of 1897 was Louis Sock Alexis, who was an American Indian who played for the Cleveland Spiders. And this, this, it was a sensation because he had so much talent. Sock Alexis was, the, was the, the five-tool player. He could hit, hit for power, and uh, he had tremendous speed running the bases and running in the outfield. He was a right fielder, and it had a tremendous throwing arm. And... Uh, Tremendous talent. Uh, very sadly, uh, he was also an alcoholic, and uh, he had a. This affected his play, and uh, and uh, he also had a severe uh, ankle injury, which was uh, related to drinking. And so, anyway, he 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 played for the. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about him later, but he played for the for the team. Now, at the end of the season, Brian McDonald, a biographer of of Sock Alexis, said this quote: "Though he would never again run as he once did." There was no question he could still hit. The only question was whether he would stay sober enough to do it. So the, uh, again, Patsy Tabot was the uh, player manager for the Spiders in 1897. He played first base and managed. He hit 267, 15 doubles, nines, triples, 59 RBIs, 11 stolen bases in 109 games. Patsy Tabot. Chief Zimmer, again, was our very capable catcher. Good player, tremendous person. He hit, Zimmer hit 316, 22 doubles, three triples, 40 RBIs, eight stolen bases in 80 games. So he he was injured and missed missed some time. But you know, tremendous player, Chief Zimmer. Cupid Childs was back at second base. Childs hit 338. Fine year for him. 15 doubles, nine triples, a home run, 61 RBIs, 25 stolen bases in 114 games. Now, there was bad morale on the team uh, late in the year and disharmony, and Child said this in August, quote, We are no longer the Spiders or the Indians. We are the Quitters. So he was uh, feeling bad about, about, about how, the way things were going with, with the ball team. Ed McKean was back at shortstop. McKean hit 273, 21 doubles, 14 triples, two home runs, 78 RBIs, 15 stolen bases in 125 games. Ed McKean has had this to say about Louis Sock Alexis. In 1913, after Sock Alexis died, died young, died at age 42, quote, Old Sox was a wonder when he joined, uh, joined us in 97. His coming to our club was one of the greatest sensations of the time. I can't recall any ball player in recent years with the exception of shoeless Joe Jackson, who attracted as much universal attention on his arrival as Old Sox. He was a remarkable hitter a man of remarkable speed, and a fair outfielder. Now, in April in Louisville, uh, Sock Alexis and Ed Bikin hit the longest two home runs that had ever, ever been hit in Sportsman Park. On July 23rd, in a game, McKean playing third base, tripped a runner who was going around third who would have scored. The umpire didn't see it, and he got away with it. And it was reported, quote, McKean, grinning like a full-fledged comedian, got away with the trick. Ed McKean. At third base, Bobby Wallace was the regular play, player. But Wallace, you know, former starting pitcher, had a, had a very good year. He hit 335. That's amazing. 33 doubles, 21 triples, four home runs, 112 RBIs, 
14 stolen bases in 130 games. And so, uh, yeah, like I said, the former Spider starting pitcher who moved from the mound to third base, Bobby Wallace. Jesse the Crab Burkett was back in uh, the outfield, regular outfielder. He hit 383. Incredible. 28 doubles, 7 triples, 2 home runs, 60 RBIs, 28 stolen bases in 127 games. And Burkett was the guy who discovered Luis Alexis while coaching at Holy Cross College. And they urged Patsy Tabot to sign Sokalexis. Uh, however, early in the season, Sokalexis was hitting 350 and Burkett 250. And then Jesse Burkett became jealous of Sokalexis. Very sad. And he said, quote, wait till I strike my gate and I will make him go back t- t- to the woods and look for a few scalps. So that was too bad uh, that he had that uh, bad attitude. On July 4th in Pittsburgh, a line drive was hit to the outfield that went between the legs of Jesse Burkett uh, all the way to the wall, and he was he became disgusted and refused to chase down the ball. That's not good. Uh, Ed McKean from the infield had to go all the way out, and four runs scored. Must have been a bases-loaded hit. Um, it was reported that Burkett played emotionally out of control all season. Tremendous player, but he had his uh, problems uh, with emotional problems. Uh, the uh, Another... Uh, Regular outfielder was Ali Pickering, who was, uh, played center field. Pickering hit 352. Uh, five doubles, two triples, a home run, 22 RBIs, eight, 22 RBIs, and eight, 18 stolen bases in 46 games. Pickering was from Olney, Illinois. He died in Vincennes, Indiana, 1952, at age 81. Career record of 271, nine home runs, 287 RBIs. Pickering played for the Louisville Cardinals, Cleveland Spiders, Cleveland Blues, Cleveland Broncos, Philadelphia Athletics, St. Louis Browns, and Washington Senators between 1896 and 1908. After he retired, he worked as an umpire. He was the first batter in the American League. The term Texas Leaguer is attributed to the debut of Pickering, either in the majors or in the Texas League, when he had had seven straight bloop hits. Ali Pickering. And then the man of 1897, Louis Sakalexis, was a regular outfielder. He hit 338, nine doubles, eight triples, three home runs, 42 RBIs, 16 stolen bases in only 66 games. Sakalexis was from the Penobscot Indian Reservation in Maine. He died in Burlington, Maine, in 1913 at age 42. A career he hit, for his career, he hit 313, three home runs, 55 RBIs. And his entire MLB career was for the Cleveland Spiders between 1897 and 1899. He's in the Cleveland Indians Hall of Fame. He had uh, one of his nicknames was the Deerfoot of the Diamond. He was a Penobscot Indian, the first Major League pl- baseball player who was an American Indian. Uh, his birth, he was born on the reservation near, near Old Town, Maine. His grand- grandfather was chief of the Bear Clan. He went to college at the College of the Holy Cross in Worcester, Maine, for two years, and hit 444 one year. And then he transferred to Notre Dame and was expelled for a drinking episode. He made his MLB debut on April 22. Uh, the, the real tragic thing happened on July 4th. He was drunk and reportedly jumped or fell from a second-story window of a brothel and had a very severe ankle injury did, and didn't get uh, good medical care. And this really ended uh, his uh, <coughs> ability to run the bases so well and run the outfield so well. He was released in 1899. He continued in the minor leagues. He coached youth baseball until 1901, played in the minors till 1903. He, he developed tuberculosis and died on Christmas Eve. Uh, now, the cha- he had a lot of challenges as a player in MLB opposing fans and their racial slurs. Fans would imitate imitate the war dances and war whoops of Indians. And uh, now there is a debate whether the Cleveland Indians today are named after Sock or the 1914 Boston Braves. So apparently there's evidence of both. He's in the Cl- American Indian Hall of Fame. His co- cousin Andrew Sock was a marathon runner and finished second in the, in the 1912 and 1913 Boston Marathon and fourth in the 1912 Stockholm Olympics. There's a quote about Sock Alexis, quote, Sock Alexis was strong and fast and there was fire in every movement. 
Uh, however, his uh, weaknesses were alcoholism, and reportedly he could not hit a curveball thrown by a left-handed pitcher. Uh, and the Cleveland Indians uh, were, or the Cleveland baseball team in the American League years later, in 1915, took the name the Indians. And it was reported, quote, reported in the Plain Dealer newspaper, quote, many years ago there was an Indian named Sakalexis who so far who so far outshone his teammates that he naturally came to be regarded as the whole team. The fans throughout the country began to call the Clevelanders the Indians. It was an honorable name, and while it stuck, the team made an excellent record. It has now been decided to revive this name. The Clevelands of 1915 will be the Indians. There will be no real Indians on the roster, but the name will recall fine traditions. It is looking backward to a time when Cleveland was one of the most popular teams in the United States. It also serves to revive the memory of a single great player who has been gathered to his fathers in the happy hunting ground of Abenakis. Now, big, at the beginning of 1897, uh, it was reported that Sock Alexis was, quote, the hottest gate attraction in baseball. The Sporting Life wrote, quote, that Sock Alexis was, quote, a massive man with gigantic bones and bulging muscles who looks like a ball player from the ground to the top of his Five foot eleven inches of solid framework. Future Hall of Famer Huey Jennings said this said that Sock Alexis, in his opinion, had the most ability of any player that ever played the game. Uh, he's the first recognized minority of any kind in, in, in national league history. He was expelled from Notre Dame uh, with a teammate, uh, and it was reported that Sock Alexis and one of his baseball teammates at Ob- Ob- at Notre Dame, quote, visited an establishment and wrecked the place. While they were demolishing the furniture and hurling the broken parts out of the windows, the local gendarmes arrived on the scene. They tried to quiet Sock Alexis, but only annoyed him. He became so annoyed that he flattened two of the coppers with perfectly delivered rights to their jaws. But he was finally overpowered and dragged to the Bastille. Now, Sock Alexis arrived in the major leagues with a serious drinking problem. Uh, actually, the team during at, during that time, at least the first for, for that season, was uh, took the name Indians. They were the Cleveland Indians in 1897. On March 27th, the Plain Dealer wrote this quote, The Indians have a spring schedule which is bound to give them good hard work. Early in the season, Sock Alexis was erratic in the field, but he was hitting very well, making made some spectacular catches, and attendance was up at Spiders games at home and away. Everyone wanted to see Sock Alexis. The Sporting News reported, quote, Everybody in Cleveland, as well as in the other league cities, for that matter, are talking Sock Alexis. And if the young Indian isn't the best advertised new man that ever entered the big organization, then it will not be the fault of the baseball paragraphers of the press. In late June in Chicago, Sock Alexis was in a bar fight, and it was reported that, quote, a hanger-on at the bar had socks by the neck with one hand and a big cheese knife in the other when the police inter- interfered. The Plain Dealer wrote this, quote, Patsy DeBose still has hopes that the great Indian will come to his senses, and it is hoped that he will. He is likely to see that his popularity depends upon his ability as a player and will not last after that ability is gone. If Sock Alexis takes proper care of himself, his baseball career is bound to be a most brilliant one. If not, he will soon find that he was a nine-day wonder and that the nine days have passed. It will not take many days to decide the fate of Cleveland's great find. Now, I'm reading a book called Indian Summer, the Forgotten Story of Louis Sock Alexis, the first Native American in Major League Baseball by Brian McDonald, 2003. And a lot of good information on Sock Alexis. Uh, he quotes Harry Grayson as saying that Sock Alexis was, quote, baseball's most tragic figure. Huey Jennings, quote, he should have been the greatest player of all time, greater than Cobb, uh, Ty Cobb, Honus Wagner, Napoleon Lajouet, Rogers Hornsby, and any of the other men who made history for the game of baseball. In 1897, the Indian Wars were still fresh in the minds of the American people. Sock Alexis was handsome, college-educated. In the College of Holy Cross, for in two years, one year, Sock Alexis hit 436 and the next 444. He batted left and threw right. Uh, when he signed to the Spiders, uh, he signed with the Spiders, and then there were there were 
some of the things people would say. They called him Chief Socket on the Nose and Big Big Man Socket to him. He was impressive with his powerful hitting, his speed running the outfield, his strong throwing arm. In a preseason game in Ann Arbor, Michigan, a small group of Potawatomi Indians came to cheer Sock Alexis. However, the racial abuse was very, very difficult, and Sock Alexis said this, quote, No matter where we play, I go through the same ordeal, and at the present time I am so used to it that at times I forget to smile at my tormentors. Now, the spider, his Spiders teammates did accept him. He was easy to like. He was, had a very easygoing nat- nature, had a good sense of humor. He was a good guy, except for his this drinking Terrible drinking problem. On May, on May 6th, uh, Sock Alexis made a catch in deep right. There was a runner on third base, a diving catch. And uh, after he caught the ball, he jumped to his feet and threw out the runner at home plate, which is like an almost impossible play. And the fans would uh, cheer, Sock it to him, Sock Alexis. On May 7th, the Cleveland Plain Dealer reported, quote, the man who said that there are no good Indians except dead Indians, or words to that effect, surely never saw one Louis Sock Alexis late of the Penobscot tribe, but now of the tribe of Taboo. Sock Alexis smoked Cuban cigars and could quote Homer's The Iliad and Shakespeare. So he had some, he was a knowledgeable guy. On Memorial Day in Brooklyn, there were 18,000 fans come to, coming to, to see him play for the Spiders, the largest crowd in Brooklyn history up until that time. Uh, the challenge that he had is that all the pitchers wanted to get him out because, you know, he was so popular. And along with the, bu- the abuse he received from fans and opposing players. At the Polo Grounds in, uh, in New York against the Giants, Sock Alexis hit a home run that went out of the park. And that was the highlight of his brief career. Three months later, uh, and this is an aside, that the famous letter from, to the New York Sun, quote, Yes, Virginia, there is a Santa Claus. Now that ankle injury and his drinking le- meant that he had a... Had a an uncertain future. Very strong start, but he was ineffective in the second half of the season. Very often wasn't playing, wasn't playing as well. He'd go up and hit, but he couldn't run well, and he, you know, which had, a, you know, really it took away his ability on, as a base runner, as an, and as an outfielder. Now another, uh, now the bench players included Jack O'Connor, who was a utility player. They called him Peach Pie. O'Connor had 290, 21 doubles, four triples, two home runs. 69 RBIs, 20 stolen bases in 103 games. O'Connor's, O'Connor was good friends with Sock Alexis. Unfortunately, O'Connor's, O'Connor was a heavy drinker, and that you know, so he was a bad influence on Louis Sock Alexis. Uh, Lou Krieger was another uh, bench player. He was a catcher. He had 225, four doubles, a triple, zero home runs, 22 RBIs, five stolen bases in 39 games. Lou Krieger. Sport McAllister was a spare outfielder. McAllister hit 219, five doubles, a triple, 11 RBIs, three stolen bases in 43 games. McAllister also did a little pitching, went one and two with an ERA of 4.50, four games, three starts, and three complete games. Harry Blake was another bench outfielder who hit 256, three doubles, a triple, a home run, 15 RBIs, five stolen bases in 32 games. Harry Blake. Jimmy McCallier was a bench player. He hit uh, 220, 20 hits, two doubles, 10 RBIs, four stolen bases in 24 games. So McCallier was had a tough year. And uh, yeah, so anyway, I, Ira Belden was another outfielder. Hit 267, eight hits, two triples, four RBIs in eight games. Belden was from Cleveland, Ohio. He died in Lakewood, Ohio, in 1916 at age 42. And his MLB career was just with the Cleveland Spiders in 1897. Dale Gear was an outfielder uh, off the bench at 167, four hits, a double, two RBIs, two stolen bases in, in seven games. And Gear's MLB career was just with Cleveland in 1897. Fred Cook was another uh, spare outfielder coming off the bench. He hit 294, five hits, two doubles, three RBIs in five games. Cook was from Illinois. He died in Gallipolis, Ohio in 1923 at age 49 or 50. He played for the Cleveland Spiders in 1897 and was manager for the Fort Wayne, Fort Wayne Indians in the Interstate League also in 1897, Fred Cook. Now our pitching staff, again, was anchored. Our ace pitcher was, uh, was the incomparable Cy Young. Young hit 222, 34 hits, 4 doubles, 3 triples, 
19 RBIs, 4 stolen bases in 48 games. His record as a pitcher was 21-19. and 19. ERA of 3.78, 46 games, 38 starts, 35 complete games, and 2 shutouts. Young, on September 18th, threw a no-hitter uh, in Cincinnati against the Reds. In the sixth inning, there was a hard-hit ball that got past Bobby Wallace at third base and was ruled a hit. However, Wallace was able to convince the official scorer that it was an error, and he said this, quote, It was my error, and it was an inexcusable one. I was playing in the right spot for Bug, and the ball came straight at me, but in some way got through me. I should feel guilty if that was charged against Cy as a hit after his wonderful work. Cy Young said this later, quote, It looked like a hit off me more than it did an error for Bobby, but Wallace sent a note to the scorer's box, begging to be given an error in order to allow me me, a, a, a no-hit game. I've never forgotten him for that, but it was only one instance of the good fellowship prevailing on the old Cleveland club. On May 29th, uh, Cy Young got his 200th win. In 1897, uh, Cy Young's, uh, it, was his, it was his worst year since his start as an MLB player, but for anyone else, it was a pretty good year. Not great, but for his standards, it, w- it wasn't that great. Still a tremendous year. He had actually pitched 784 innings pitched the previous two years, so he was probably tired. Another pitch, a second pitcher in the rotation was Zeke Wilson, who hit 224, 26 hits, a triple, nine RBIs, three stolen bases, and 37 ga- games. Wilson was 16 and 11 with an ERA of 4.16, 34 games, 30 starts, 26 complete games, and a shutout. Zeke Wilson. Jack Powell was third in the, in the rotation. Powell hit 206, 20 hits, a double, 12 RBIs, 28 games. His record as a pitcher was 15 and 10. An ERA of 3.16, 26 stars, 24 complete games, two shutouts. Powell was from Bloomington, Illinois. He died in Chicago, Illinois, in 1944 at age 70. Career record of 245 and 254, ERA of 2.97, 1,621 strikeouts. Powell pitched for the Cleveland Spiders, St. Louis Perfectos, St. Louis Cardinals, St. Louis Browns, New York Highlanders between 1997 and 1912. He has the eighth most losses in MLB history. 15th most complete games, 422. He had four 20-loss seasons. He has the record for the most wins of a career pitcher with a losing record, Jack Powell. The next pitcher in the rotation was Nick Cuppy, who hit 145, eight hits, a triple, a three RBIs, and 21 games. Cuppy went 10 and six with an ERA of 3.20, 17 starts, 13 complete games, and a shutout. So an off year for Nick Cuppy. He's, I think his uh, his arm was wearing out. He'd done an awful lot of good work for Cleveland. Henry Blake was another pitcher. He also played in the outfield. Uh, Clark hit uh, 280, seven hits, three RBIs in seven games. His record as a pitcher was 0-4 with an ERA of 5.87, four starts and three complete games. Clark was from Bellevue, Nebraska. He died in Colorado Springs, Colorado in 1950 at age 74. Career record of 1-4, ERA of 4.99, four strikeouts. Pitched for the Cleveland Spiders in 1897, Chicago Orphans in, in 1898. So just a brief career. After he retired, he was elected to the Nebraska State Legislature and also as a railroad commissioner. He had been a high school valedictorian. So this guy, he had some talent. And he played played college baseball baseball for Williams College. Henry Blake. He uh, transferred to the University of Chicago, and uh, he played... He played football for Amos Alonzo Stagg's Chicago Maroons football team in 1895 and 1896. He got his law degree from the University of Michigan. In 1899, he was a baseball coach, and he worked as a lawyer and, again, for the, in the Nebraska legislature. He helped pass the pure food law. The last year of his life was spent in a psychiatric hospital in Colorado Springs because he had developed Alzheimer's. Henry Blake. Mike McDermott was another pitcher. McDermott hit 320, eight hits, 25 at bats, a triple, and five RBIs. Pitching record was four and five, an ERA of 4.50, nine games, seven starts, and four complete games. McDermott was from St. Louis, Missouri. He died in St. Louis in 1943 at age 80. Career record of 11 and 33, 69 strikeouts, an ERA of 6.17. 
He pitched for the Louisville Colonels, Cleveland Spiders, and St. Louis Browns between 1895 and 1897. Mike McDermott. Charlie Brown was another pitcher. Brown hit 273, three hits, 11 at bats, a double, and an RBI. Brown's record was 1 and 2 with an ERA of 7.77, four starts, two complete games. Brown was from Bluffton, Indiana. He died in Monclova, Ohio in 1938 at age 66. And his MLB career was just with the Spiders in 1897. And finally, John Papalau was another pitcher. Uh, He batted five times, did not get a hit, had two walks and an RBI in two games. Record as a pitcher was 0-1 with an ERA of 10.50, two games, a a start, and a complete game. Papalau was from Albany, New York, died, died in Albany in 1944 at age 69. And his MLB career was just with the Spiders in 1897. Now, the, after the regular season was over in the postseason, the World Series, also known as the Temple Cup that year, the second place Baltimore Orioles defeated the first place Boston Bean Eaters four games to one. So that's the story of the 1897 Cleveland Spiders. It was, it was really an interesting year, especially uh, Louis Sock Alexis and his place. What a tragic fellow. Good guy, but it just shows, shows how tragic, uh, tragic alcoholism is and how many really wonderful good people have been destroyed by that scourge over the centuries. God bless the fellows who played for the Cleveland Spiders in 1897 and everyone else associated with the team, including the fans, especially the Civil War veterans. Captains of the Cuyahoga, lovers of Lake Erie, Terminal Tower Power, fans of the Free Stamp Statue and the Fountain of Eternal Life, Euclid Avenue Electricity, uh, friends, uh, First First Energy Stadium friends, Quicken Loans Arena enthusiasts, Progressive Field pals. It's been 70 years since 1948. This is our year. Tribe, Browns, Cavs, Monsters, and Gladiators rule Cleveland City of Champions. Thank you so much for watching. I really, really, really appreciate it. God bless you. Take care, and I'll see you next time.